give it a good name. I'll take it. Okay. okay. <laughs>
He has been engaged in municipalities and to promote sensible outdoor lighting usage. And finally, working with the Buffalo National, National Red River to establish it as one of the, on the short list of parks to be designated as the International Dark Sky Park. He can be seen regularly speaking to civic clubs and to other organizations promoting the natural state of dark skies. Relating to the Mid-States region, he has been the chair of the 2015 conference held in Little Rock. Because of this, I recommend James Bruce McMath for the miserable 2018 Amateur of the Year Award. And when I say that, 
you know, to me, it's, it's as if, you know, we have like a Charles Mercy amongst our midst here, okay? We have someone that is, um, uh, you know, he has, through his tireless work in, in finding comments, but also through his tireless work in helping each one of us uh, learn more about the solar system we live in, uh, to, uh, you know, all of his interviews with all the luminaries, you know, that uh, he has met and has known, uh, where, you know, any one of us now can just come up and, and talk to David, you know? Any one of you can come up here and get your uh, books photographed by him. And, you know, I've known other people that, uh, you know, they're very uh, ostentatious. Their egos are way up here, okay? That's not David. David does what he does because he loves astronomy. He loves all the things that astronomy does for people. He loves the fact that, that people's minds open up, their hearts open up. And so his whole life, since he was a little boy, has been all about this. It's been this amazing journey. And I'm so excited that his autobiography is finally coming out. You know, um, I have stayed at David's home. He has invited me to his home. He's done that for many people, you know, and to, to, to walk down the halls and see all the awards and all the accolades and everything. So it is, it's amazing to see all the things that he's done. But then you sit down with him and he's just a regular guy, you know. And so, what can I say? I, I'm, I'm honored, I'm deeply, um, Cherishing the thought, it's almost like a dream to me that he's come to Arkansas to finally see my little company and um, and to be here with us tonight. And um, so let me introduce my friend, my hero, Dovid Lee. didn't. And so here we go. I'm about to share my life with you for the next hour or so, and I hope you will enjoy it. Most of it's, most of it's good. Not all of it is good, but I'd like to share with you a little bit of it. This presentation actually forms the basis of my autobiography, which all being well, if Wendy approves, will come out next year. And uh, I hope that I'll be able to come back at some point next year. Scotty has promised that, but uh, we're not really sure yet um, if that's going to happen. But I'd like to come back next year and do a book launching here at some appropriate venue. Would you like to arrange that? I would like to arrange that. This has been a uh, very special meeting. And I wanted to thank all of you for being here and sharing the evening with me tonight. It's been a wonderful banquet, a wonderful meeting, and everything has just gone perfectly. It's been absolutely terrific. The only problem is the name of the sponsoring organization, the Sugar Creek Astronomical Society, because as a diabetic, it's got to be the Sponda Creek Astronomical Society or the Equal Creek Astronomical Society. How many of us are diabetics? Oh, come on, there are more of you than that. Okay. Okay, there we are. Okay. All right, so. Uh, well, we hopefully have a lot of young people in the audience who eventually will become diabetics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll, just, we'll just see what happens. Well, there's a lot of different things that come up in a, in a lifetime. There is um, this book, which when you first see it, you're going to think, oh, 2001, Space Odyssey. He read the book before he saw the movie. 
This is not a novel. This is a book I found in my dad's collection shortly after uh, he passed away in 1985. And I was able to take a look at it and see what it was. And I noticed that he, um, he inscribed it to my mom. But look what he, how he inscribed it, lest you forget. I never realized how much dad loved Arthur C. Clarke. And uh, I remember watching that movie once, twice, maybe a total of about 20 times now. I'd say I watch it maybe tw once or twice, a, no, twice or three times a year. And I love it as if it were the first time I've seen it. It's great. You know, it goes, I think, for 43 minutes or so before the first words are spoken. And then at the very end, there's there are actually very few words during the entire movie. And uh, it's just absolutely incredible. But, but the whole idea is that this man really thought of something unique and original and wonderful when he got the idea for a short story called The Sentinel. And then Stanley Kubrick suggested that uh, he wanted to make a movie based on The Sentinel. And uh, Clark decided to write the book, 2001, at the same time the film was being made. He had the, uh, he had the Stargate over at Saturn in the book instead of the Jupe over Ju near Jupiter. But then as he, when he wrote 2010, he had moved it all to Jupiter. Somebody complained about it and he wrote back, he said, it's fiction, stupid. <laughs> And we have uh, pictures like this, which uh, you think are done with a lot of care and thinking, but if you see that parking lot light in the foreground, that's not how this picture is taken. Uh, but if you look at the snow pattern there, that's the Southern Cross. I've always wanted a picture of the Southern Cross, and there she be, right there. Also promise I wasn't going to, I was not going to quote tonight anything because I'm assuming that most of you know how to read. And so the very first opportunity I'm going to bring up in my report, if reasons reach transcend the sky, why should it then to earth be bound? The wind is wrong and let her eye of mine be married to the ground. That, those words were written in like 1560. And I never knew those words until I was doing some research for my doctoral dissertation over at the Linda Hall Library, which is only about a three-hour drive north of here. How many of you have seen the Linda Hall Library, I'd love to ask? A lot of you. How many of you want to see the Linda Hall Library at some point? If I had asked, have some more hands, come on. Can't imagine how many of you don't want to see it. You gotta see it. This is a special library. It is the world's largest library devoted to science and engineering. It is wonderful. So I'm sitting down there and I'm doing work on my thesis, and one of the librarians comes in, one of the officials of the library comes in, and he's talking to me, and uh, he had this book he wanted me to look at. And so I put down what I was looking at, and I opened up the uh, thing that he had, and it was manuscript, it was handwritten material. And that got me interested that I had a handwritten material. <coughs> And then it was recording observing sessions. And I said, who's observing log is this? And he said, look at the front page, Sir John Herschel. Original logs, now I'm going to one <laughs> OK. <clears throat> anyway, we were talking and uh, pretty animatedly. And I said, you know, I have observing logs. And I've kept them for a long time. He said, we know. <laughs> we make it our business to know. We're like the FBI. <laughs> and I said, would you be interested one day when I finally depart this mortal coil in having my observing logs? He said, please, it won't be for a long time, but yes, we would. And over the next few years, we developed a contract, and then I went back again. By this time, it was my third visit to Linda Hall with all of my observing logs. 
with and great apologies. I said, I'm really, really sorry that the uh, laws, the observing records from 1970 and 1976 are mingled with my personal journal, my personal diary. And the lady just stared at me. And I said, what, what did I say something wrong? And she said, you have a personal diary as well? I said, yeah. And she said, since how long have you been keeping it? And I said, since about 1958. Does that look in your face mean that you want me to donate my absurd, my regular diary to you as well? Yes. <laughs> my next trip along came the rest of the personal diaries. And then I said, would you like to have my comet hunting records? Yes. And so the next visit, there was a lot of comet hunting records, dozens and dozens of them, two huge boxes and suitcases full of stuff that came, along with all of the original interviews for the biographies I've written. I've written three biographies, Bart Bach, Clyde Tombaugh, and Gene Shoemaker. And Gene Shoemaker, I would like to say, was the person who funded this auditorium. Uh, and unfortunately, there were two different shoemakers, you know, because the spelling is, is, is different. And so, as much as I'd like to say that, I'd turn that into a joke, I can't. Uh, anyway, so, we'll dedicate this room tonight to Gene, <clears throat> at least this moment. Anyway, the last time I was there, they asked if Wendy had kept a journal. And I said, my wife Wendy has kept a diary. She kept it pretty much until her first marriage broke up in 1985, and then started keeping it again when she and I got together. She's keeping it ever since. Now, you're not trying to tell me that you want Wendy's journals as well, do you? Yes. <laughs> so Wendy's thinking about that. She had to, we had to talk to our daughter and see if it's okay. <laughs> anyway. So I was joking around with him, just give them the house. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. But maybe, maybe there should be a museum of the amateur astronomer somewhere in the world. And maybe the Linda Hall Library should run that museum. And I'm just talking off the top of my head here, and this is I'm glad nobody's tape recording this because that may never happen. But if it does, it does. And uh, that is something that, uh, that we are considering. But in the meantime, I hope I'm going to be around for 120 or 30 years. And uh, I really want to see the, there's a total solar eclipse in 2045. I will be 97. And I would like to be able to see it. At least a skeletal view of it. <laughs> anyway, so much for that. I really want to see the 2024 eclipse, but I'm figuring I'm going to miss that one. Because more important than seeing it in Texas, which would be very close to where we live in Arizona, I want to see it in the place where I grew up in Montreal, Canada. Maybe even this place where this picture of this six year old is right now. That's me in 1954, but the reason I'm showing it is that I want to uh, call your attention to the inset. The inset is Leslie Peltier's final comet discovery in June 1954. When this picture of me was taken, Leslie Peltier was just discovering that comet in the background. And uh, so that's something that I didn't think, the connection we didn't really think we had and something that we ended up having, that Leslie and I became fairly close friends and uh, rode and visited a couple of times and uh, really loved and admired the man. And, uh, you know, I remember lending my copy of Starlight Nights to my dad to read. And he says, well, thanks, I love to read. I know he loves to read. My father read like John Kennedy. He would take a book and go, this would be done within about an hour, and he'd remember every word. That was something else. I really did enjoy that. But when I gave him Starlight Nights, I said, lots of people have written books about how to observe the sky. This one tells you why. 
And so dad started to read it, and about a day later he came back and he said, now I know why my son got so interested in astronomy. I never really knew until I read this book. But you explained it very well in this guy's pages. And as we go on, my parents love to send me to summer camp. Why they chose this one, I'll never know, because I hated it. <laughs> so they did tell me. I felt so alone there. There was no bullying or anything like that. In fact, the kids were actually very kind to one another at this camp. But you'll see this picture, there's uh, two staff people, and they go from uh, right to left. The second little boy on the right, the lanky guy, homesick guy, is me. And uh, right around after that picture was taken, around the 4th of July, and uh, they were doing the fireworks display, and all the fireworks were going off, and it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> and then after that was over, it was about a quarter of the way through, they dismissed the youngest kids back to their cabins. And since I was one of the youngest kids, we're walking up the hill to our cabin. And I'm looking up at the sky. I mean, I didn't know from what the sky was back then. I was only eight. And I saw a shooting star, just like that. It wasn't anything. It was maybe a second magnitude thing, starting in Hercules and ending near Vika. And it really wasn't really worth calling to attention. But I saw it. And I asked the others, did any of you see that shooting star just now? They looked at me and they said, no. And I suddenly thought, is this a message sent just for me? That I really ought to be interested in what's going on up there? And I put it away in my little eight-year-old Duffy brain. And I just let it, let it sit fester for a while. And uh, the next year, walking home from our school, uh, our school, or I was in a school in Montreal. A lot of interesting people went to that school. In particular, the famous singer Leonard Cohen was a student at Rossi School. I never knew Leonard, but uh, he preceded me by about a decade, I think, over at that school. He preceded me by about a decade at West Mount High School, at McGee University, <coughs> and at the Charge Mime Synagogue that his grandparents had founded in the mid-1800s. Mid <clears throat> and so that was really quite something to be able to have that connection, even though I've never met the man. I've always admired the, uh, the music that he's done. And I think I listened to Hallelujah once a week. <laughs> Just put it on and listen to it, because it's that good. It's so good that I have to listen to it once a week. And I think everybody here does too. But if I play it now, the talk will go on all night, and I know that you have other things to do, places to do. <clears throat> but anyway, the following year, as I'm going back from Austin school, a friend of everyone says, Did you hear that the Russians launched this s satellite in space? And I understood what he was saying somehow that it's going around the Earth. Just like a new moon. They launched a new moon into space on a rocket ship. And I got back and I was excited to tell my family about it. Mom and Dad were worried because they were well aware of the military implications of this version of space race. But I didn't care about that. I thought, this is great. We're going to Excuse me, Mom. When I hear you she said this And actually, as, as, I, as I'm thinking about this, they're, so they're going into space. Think of the possibilities of observing the sky from outside the atmosphere. This is wonderful. Think of the possibilities of getting pictures like that, which is something I got recently from my own backyard. And if you look carefully, I never saw the meteor that's off on the left or right. But that's a little piece of Ali's comment, seeing in early May, a few years ago. This is what astronomy is all about. And I promise you tonight, after giving this uh, major award to, to last night's speaker and to someone who's done so much 
to promote astronomy. I have to admit I am far from the smartest tool in the box, but I don't know if I can find anybody who is more passionate, simply passionate, about the night sky, who just lives it, dreams it, and just goes out and enjoys it. I'm trying to downsize it a little bit, and so just in the last couple of weeks, three of the telescopes, including some from me, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> But none of the sports scientific goes <laughs> And at first he was reluctant, this car was reluctant to take them, but then he got kind of into it and gave him a second one, and I gave the first, first one, and then I gave him the telescope. She was sending the one with it, and the second one, and then came the third one. And then while I was gone, he came to the house, and he and Wendy went through and looked at other things, and he found a wonderful Questar tripod. Not the telescope, but the tripod. And when he said, you're not using that, are you? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> so he as well. And I called him, I got a little worried. I said, Steve, don't take the refrigerator. <laughs> don't take the washing machine. And you can't have the house. <laughs> we just laughed and laughed. It was so much fun. And, uh, but it, it's what I do. I just love looking at the night sky. And we're going to take a little breather now and play some music. I'm just going to show you some pictures that I have taken, mostly of objects in the night sky. The music that I'm going to use, remember this is called talk, text, and tunes. So there is talk, there is text, not the kind of text that Scott has all the time. <laughs> but the text refers to the forthcoming autobiography, and then the tunes, which we're about to start right now. This tune is from the country group Alabama, and it's my favorite Alabama song. It's called This Side of the Moon. <coughs> telescope, that is Professor Summer, that is our granddaughter, taken some time ago. She is now a sophomore at Fort Lewis College in Southern Colorado. She is a golfer and she is uh, just an amazing, an amazing person. And I'm hoping there will be a picture of our grandson later on that, uh, that I can show you as well. You can't give a talk if when you have grandchildren. You can't give a talk to any talk to show any pictures of just is against the law. You put in jail if you give a talk and don't show pictures of your grandchildren. Or your first telescope. That was my first telescope. And that is the one that, that's going to be my next donation, I think, to Linda Hall, if they accept telescopes, because if you look at that, that is not a book. It is a telescope and it's still working, and uh, uh, I still use it, and I can look at the moon, the bright planets, and you can do a little occasional fun comment searching with it. But it really needs a place where more young kids could really use it the way I did. I remember the first time I looked through that telescope was in September of 1960. And I had it, and I had no idea what I was looking at. I didn't have uh, my cell phone, I was working with my cell so I couldn't tell what I was looking at, but there was a bright star in the south. Well, let's start with that. It turned out that was Jupiter. And Galileo could have felt no greater thrill than I did that night when I saw Jupiter, the cloud bands, and the four moons. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. It was amazing. What was also there that night that I did not notice was a comet. Wouldn't that have been fun if I had noticed the comet with my very first look at a telescope? <laughs> but there was a comet in, that, in the field that night. A comet that would go around Jupiter over and over and over again, going a little farther away, going a little closer, until in July of 1992, it would get so close to Jupiter that it would break up into 20 pieces. And all the dust that would escape, 
bright and common enough so that a few months later it allowed it to be discovered. And with a little bit of luck, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Anyway, I decided that right about then, <clears throat> with my first look for a telescope, that, it, that if I'm going to be observing the night sky, I gotta write it down. And if you leave with nothing else tonight, if you don't keep an observing log, start one tonight. Very much. How many of you do keep an observing record, observing log of some sort? How many of you are planning to start one tonight? I hope so. I hope a lot of you will. Uh, because if, if observations that aren't written down are not observations. If, and and uh, I remember asking Wendy if I could change my observing record, here's one page of it, if I could change my observing record to uh, writing about, to writing it on the, on the computer, on this laptop. And Wendy had a simple response. She said, who's going to read a laptop? Who's going to read something that's on a laptop? Who's going to read it if you write it in your own hand? The originals will last forever. The originals, as you know, are now at the Linda Hall Library. You can look at them all online, speaking of laptops, at the website of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, www. don't forget that, rasc.ca. And then you can go to the menu and it says logbooks. And then Dottie's logbooks. Yeah. Actually, it doesn't quite say it that way, but uh, you can go and see it. There are thousands and thousands of sessions. I've a little bit of luck. I might even have something in here. I can show you. I don't know. This is, this is one of the log books. I started, as you know, this, the session in red there is one of the most important sessions that I've ever had. I've made two good decisions in my life, and maybe only two. This red letter session, of course, is the first of those two. That was my decision to begin searching for comets on the 17th of December, 1965. I had not the slightest hope of ever discovering a comet, because that's hard. But the search for comets is easy. <laughs> it wasn't so much later that I thought, well, maybe I should try to find one someday. But anyway, that was the first good decision. And I think everybody here knows what the second good decision was, and that was marrying Wendy. And, uh, and, and I, I think if I hadn't done that, I would not be probably not be doing an autobiography because Wendy forced me to promise that the day I finished my PhD dissertation, not two days, not a week, not a year, but the same day, I will start my autobiography. And there was one day in 2010 when Wendy, I came into the office and Wendy looked up from her computer and she said, you better start your autobiography today. <laughs> Because you just got yourself a PhD. And uh, I'm still working on it. It's, uh, it's finished. But there's still a lot that needs to be done, like the index. We have to check the spelling and a few other things. But uh, I'm hoping it'll be out either late this year or early in 2019. The observing logs. The observing logs uh, began with sessions that I added later, including an observing session that I had at the front door of our home in 1956, when uh, there were no instruments, and uh, Richard, uh, my brother Richard, had seen the Big Dipper from the front door, and he was all excited about it. Uh, I went up and he pointed it out to me and I thought I'd never forgotten that. And there are other sessions as well. Session number one, if I can 
figure this out somehow. Session number one is officially October the 2nd, 1959, a partial solar eclipse that I saw from Montreal. And I even stole a photograph of that to prove that there was a partial eclipse that day. It was total off the coast of Massachusetts that morning, but it was pretty cloudy over Montreal until just near the end when the clouds cleared away and we got this picture. <coughs> Have any of you seen this? <laughs> so how many of you saw that? Now, a lot of you did. Any of you did not see that? Some of you didn't. Well, if you didn't, would you like to see it now? Yeah. <laughs> Wendy took a little point-and-shoot camera, and just before the television, she pointed at the sun and made a little movie, and I'd like to show you that movie right now. Of this, of this one. 
How will that never know? <laughs> One of the things about my early life was that I was a very bad asthmatic. Some of you who are listening closely to the microphone might have noticed a little wheeze here and there. And uh, it was quite a bit worse when I was a kid. So bad that I had to spend 14 months at the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children. This is for the dad and me in front of the main entrance of the as asthma home. And I love the sign for a child's sake. And uh, that's what the purpose of the asthma home was, was to try to rid us of our asthma. It didn't actually some of the worst attacks I had were after I left the home. But since my and I got married, I've hardly had any asthma at all. Although there are people in my family who disagree with it. <clears throat> but uh, there we go. One of the things that was very special in my early life that happened while I was at the asthma home was that there was a meeting in Denver called Symposium on the Exploration of Mars. And I had a cousin who was working designing the Apollo heat shield at the time. And he wrote to me and he asked if I would like to come. Oh, I would like to come. Of course I would like to come. And I got to the audience. There was uh, Willie Lay who led off the uh, speakers. And he led off with a joke that I will not repeat here because it's really in rather poor taste right now. Well, back in 1963, it was a great funny joke. <laughs> But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> right now. Um, anyway, all the people, the four people, said what they had to say, and then they opened the room to questions. And it was very formal. They had a microphone set up. And the questioner would come up and tell, tell people uh, who he or she was from, where, what institution, and then ask the question. First person was a fairly tall man. Came up to the microphone. He said, Clyde William Tomblin, New Mexico State University, and I fell on the floor. <laughs> this all there was to it. My life was done. <laughs> and I turned to my cousin and I said, That's the guy who discovered Pluto. I'm in the same room as the guy who discovered Pluto. A planet, my gosh. And he started his question by saying, For the last 30 years, I've been studying Mars. So right away, I thought, Now I know what he's been doing since he discovered Pluto. <laughs> You find out he did a lot more than just study Mars. But he had a good question. I got to know Clyde very well in later years. In fact, I wrote his autobiography, Clyde Tombaugh, and you'll see the cover shortly of that book. But my favorite picture of Clyde is this one. It was taken without a flash, and he had to sit and pose for about five seconds while I took it. And that's him, and you never guess, you probably will guess, what the name of the cat is. <laughs> Pluto. Well, the name of the cat was Pluto. Of course, it says so. I have to change that picture. <laughs> See, I told me I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> okay. This is a photograph of the stereo microscope that Clyde used to discover Pluto and all the other things he found here. Scanning stuff. And uh, that would have been the most up to date picture we have until we get this one. A spacecraft zipping past Pluto, taking a picture of Pluto and its moon Sharon in the same picture. And we want to see a movie of Pluto and Sharon orbiting each other and the very same people as she be. It's a nice, a nice feeling that gives you it. Remember that in 2015 when uh, when Horizon zipped past Pluto it was such an amazing time. Amazing thing just to watch that beautiful event. When Clyde was young, he also kept an observing log, so he would have known very well what it was like to record your observations. Look at the neatness of his penmanship. And I have another picture over here. Uh, Passy, after, after Clyde passed away, would not give me the observing logs. I didn't ask for them. That might be why she didn't give them to me. But anyway, she said she was donating them to the library at New Mexico State University. She got them all together, 
brought them to the library. Isn't that nice? To donate the, the observing ones to the library. They lasted there about a week when they were stolen. Do you want to believe that? Who would actually steal a man's observing records like that? Actually, now as time goes on, I'm not sure if they were actually stolen or if they were actually thrown out. But uh, whatever it was, I think the world lost something. The world definitely lost something when they lost Clyde. And it lost something else when those observing logs records disappeared. In fact, based on the few that I have, occasionally Clyde's son will write to me and ask, was there a record of this or that? And I would go through what I have to see if there were, if there were any records of that taken before he actually went to the observatory where the station was. There's this picture right here taken in one of the plates taken at the old observatory with a comet on it. That comet is now known as Comet Tomba Tanagra. Oh, I wanted so badly to have that comet announced. And I did some research on it, reported it to Brian Marsden, then director of the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. And he called and he said, this is very interesting, but what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, I'm not it's a comet from 59 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah. He said, well, we had kind of a policy. And I thought, oh boy, a policy. Everything's fine until someone comes up with a policy. <laughs> the policy is that for old comets, archival comets, you have to have a motive before you can announce it. And there was no order. He says, I'm quite confident that eventually it will be rediscovered. It's probably periodic. And then it will be announced. I was so disappointed and so upset. almost wanted to cry. About five years ago, the Tanagra Observatories rediscovered Comet Tomba. And it was finally announced. Including a reference to the research that I did on it way back then while I was writing the biography of the man who discovered that comet. And who discovered Pluto. I want to show you this is a picture of the launch of New Horizons that Wendy and I were actually able to attend. That was an awful lot of fun. And this here is my favorite New Horizons picture. And that's really an exciting um, view of, of a world that really looks like a plane flying over the Earth. You see the surface, you see the atmosphere. It's a world, it's a place, it's exciting. You can walk on it, actually you can't walk on it. <laughs> it's exciting nonetheless. And here's where we get to the point in the talk where I keep on saying, don't do it, don't do it. And there was somebody here wearing a uh, t-shirt this morning that said, in my day there were nine planets. I love that. I love that. But still, I'm not going to get into the idea about talking about one of the issues that really has torn the amateur astronomy community apart in recent years and brought it together all at the same time the status of Pluto. I'm not going to do it, okay, Scott? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do it, right? Okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Say the 
whatever kind of life, which is a kind of And when this whole thing was a mess, it got people upset, really upset, angry. Teachers were upset. Writers were upset. Texters were alive. He would be screaming and yelling and throwing things. Actors were very upset. <laughs> <laughs> and you think the police car there is, that protest I believe is not too far from here, but the policeman in that car was sent to quash the protest, but he joined the protest. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to protest, you've got to have a sign. <laughs> Then you have to have another sign. <laughs> and another sign. <laughs> but here is my favorite. <laughs> 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 Some 
long lost play somewhere, those are the opening lines of one of Shakespeare's very first plays, Henry VI, Part One. <clears throat> and so if you're, you're thinking about it, he is, he is a playwright, but in my view, he is also an amateur astronomer. Often imagine in an evening like this, you look over in the back at a table back there, and there's William Shakespeare sitting there. And some of you look and you notice him. Say, hey, that's William Shakespeare. And you go over and you start asking questions. Why did you do this? Why did you say this when you were writing Hamlet? And why did you do it the way you did? And Shakespeare is listening to all the questions. Finally, he says, wait a minute. I didn't come back after 400 years to talk about Hamlet. I came back to learn how to use a CCD camera. <laughs> So much for uh, the story about Pluto, the story about Shakespeare. It's kind of a nice way of bringing the various loves and passions that I have in my life together. As we bring up this photograph of a, of a working Saturn V rocket that is being towed to its once site, and the gentleman who is standing there, dwarfed by the big F1 engine, is Werner von Braun. Look at the size of that engine. You can take up housekeeping. It's humongous. And it's designed to be to work for about five minutes as it and four others launch the humongous 35 story Saturn V into space. I don't think that a politician, by its very nature, by his or her very nature, can write poetry or recite poetry. It's happened from time to time. But I think it's only happened once to the point that I would want to quote it. John F. Kennedy did. He did it twice. He did it when, in a speech before Congress, he announced his goal to land a person on the moon before the decade is out. I mean, I'm a little tiny black and white TV screen sitting on a chair on the, on the stage, and about 200 kids in the staff watching this thing. The youngest kids were like six. I was one of the older staff people. And they were watching this, and it's silent. When they asked, you know, it was a long night. They did jokes, they did um, other things. And finally, there's the picture of Neil Armstrong on the porch of the ladder and the auditorium just got silent. Totally and absolutely silent. And we're watching as he goes down one step and another and then he puts his foot into the lunar soil. And he says his words about there's one new small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Words that we have never forgotten. Words that we thought would start a new age. And they did in a way. We're no longer going to the moon. I don't know when that's going to happen and who that will be. But there was a national dream. It was more than that. It was a worldwide dream that was fulfilled that day, that wonderful, wonderful day. And I remember at the time I was in college and university. And uh, I remember one night walking outside, enjoying a night, quiet night. Looking up at the night sky, there was a bright moon in the sky, and then fog came in and made the whole thing disappear. And the fog disappeared, and the stars came out again. And I had a tape recorder with me. I pressed the button, and I started to play a little piece of music. And I would like to share that piece of music with you now as we relive that night in Nova Scotia back in 1970. segue, we now go into the prime material of my talk tonight, the search for comets. Comet hunting is not a science, and I never really got into a to be a scientist. I got into it because I love the night sky. It's not even art in a way. It's, if you can call it anything, it's really more like sport. 
But if it is a sport, it is indeed the world's slowest sport. <laughs> but as that decided over nine innings on a beautiful afternoon, but over decades as to who gets to be the first. And it certainly is not me. Right now, the person in the first place is a fellow from Australia, Rob McNaught, who I believe has discovered over 70 comets, mostly with this wonderful telescope in Australia. But the disadvantage of what Rob was doing is that suddenly the Australian government said, yeah, it's done. We're not finding you anymore. So he's not, not searching anymore, and probably will never find another comet. With an amateur astronomer like me, there's no government to tell me I can't do it, although it's wonderful. Scotty, you think there's a lot of that you can't search for comments. I think there should be a law that you, you have to be an astron amateur astronomer if you want to run for city council. You have to at least have gone out and went to the night sky. Anyone object to that? A few of you do. And uh, what if you want to be in the United States Senate? You have to do variable stars over here. The American Association of Variable Star Observers wants you to do that if you're going to be a senator or a representative. And say you want to run for president. Not one comment, but you have to have discovered two comments to do that. Well, I don't think that'll ever happen, but you can always wish. I started and uh, remember writing an article five years after I began talking about the great comet hunters who have discovered comets. And I listed uh, Pons, Jean Louis Pons, and I listed Leslie Pelletier who discovered 20, uh, 12 comets, and then came David Levy, who between 1965 and 1970 has discovered nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, I love that part of it. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I really didn't think that I ever would discover a comet. It would take a while. And I was having my own problems at the time, and something that you will read about it in my biography when it comes out, is that I had the tendency in those years uh, for depression, and it still dogs me from time to time, although not like it did there. I spent some time back then in the Allen Memorial Institute, which was a very modern version of what one might call a loony bin. I was there for two months in the summer. My parents, in this picture, trying to make the best of a bad situation, they wouldn't let me out. I was on a suicide watch. And uh, they wouldn't let me out. I was really depressed and sad. And I was a long face like this until July 10, 1972. Partial eclipse of the sun. Like a 90% partial. It was pouring rain. I thought like the weather matches my mood and nothing to see it. Suddenly, the weather, the rain stopped and started to lighten up a little bit and I could see something like that, and I ran over to the nurse's station, and I said, I know I'm on special precautions, but would you let me go outside just for a minute to see the eclipse? And the nurses stared at me as if I was nuts, which I was. <laughs> they stared at me, and they said, don't move, just stay there. And they ran off, and they came back about a minute later, and they said, your doctor is officially taking you off, so it's like precautions. You are free to go outside all you want and enjoy the eclipse. Boy, that was fun. I got this picture every day. <clears throat> and this is another picture of what was really a pretty sad summer. Just about eight years after that, I was in Arizona, trying to take the comet search thing a lot more seriously. And uh, that happened. On November the 13th, 1984, when I discovered my very first comet. And uh, this is a photograph that Seki took of this comet. It was the first time I was using the uh, special Tri-X uh, film. It was very, very fast to get a lot more on the image of that, like that. And it was also the first and last time that I put devoted an entire page of my journey log to a single observing session. 
discovered comet 1984. Nothing else on that day. I've always loved comets, but comets really are my children. Always loved to study them, loved to enjoy them, loved to write about them, and I loved to read poems about, poems about them as well. Especially this one that I was introduced to in graduate school at Queen's University by Gerard Manley Hopkins. I am like a slip of comet, scarce worth discovery, in some corners seem bridging the slender difference of two stars. But when she sights the sun, she grows and sizes and spins her skirts up while her central star shakes its cocooning mists. And so she comes to fields of light. Millions of traveling rays pierce her. She hangs upon the flame-chased sun and sucks the light as full by Stephen space. But then her tether calls her. She falls off. And as she dwindles, sheds her smock of gold, and then goes out to look at Captain Mistook. So I go out, my little sweet is done. I have drawn me from this contagious sun to not a gentle death, now forth, I run. I think it's a lovely, lovely poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And uh, just a few years later, in 1987, I found this comet and uh, wrote it with me in my observing log. And then the same year, I found the second comet that year. I don't seem to have a picture of it, but I did do a drawing of it in my blog. And then came uh, one in 1988. And that was kind of interesting because uh, not two weeks later, Jim and Carolyn Shoemaker discovered a comet. When they were trying to look at my comet, gotten their uh, figures on and they took them on the field and they got something else that turned out to have a new comment. When they reported it, it was completely discovered. <coughs> their new comment and my new comment were actually physically related in that 12,000 years ago they were a single object that broke apart. Probably when they were very far from comets that I've discovered, just very nice ones. But all of these comet finds never diminished my love of just the subject of comets. Being able to see these meandering, marauding creatures of the night. <clears throat> this is the brightest comet that I've ever found in 1990. A very, very nice, pretty comet. I remember the Space Shuttle Columbia did observations of it, so I had to be part of that. So I drove out to California and I watched the landing that very day of the uh, Space Shuttle as it came in to um, Edwards Air Force Base. This is a photograph, which is kind of hard to get now, but it is the discovery set of photographs of the comet now known as Comet Shoemaker Levy 9. And it also got into my observing log this way. And uh, to discuss the entire issue of this online would really require a separate talk, or I'd have to keep you here another two hours. I really don't have to do that. But um, but anyway, uh, I put it. It was really quite a story because Carol and Stanley and. Uh, I'm, working on one of my books. In fact, it was called The Quest for Comets. Gene Shoemaker is inside. A dark room. Can... No, actually, it was right away. He was reading a copy of Time Magazine. Just relaxing. And suddenly, Caroline stops. She looks at me, looks at her husband, and she says, I don't know what I've got, but it looks like a squashed comet. And Gene wanted to know what a squash comet looks like, so he jumped up and took a look at it. And then he looked at me with the most awestruck look I've ever seen on a man. I thought, I'd better take a look at this. And it looked exactly like the, like the drawing at the bottom of this page represents. Really just so incredible to be able to see that. We reported it, we described it, and then I thought, we need to get someone to confirm this but it was cloudy that one day, 
Uh, I found a nice really clear in Arizona, so I called a friend of mine, Jim Scotty, who was observing that very, very night, and he said that he's pretty busy right now and really doesn't have the time. And I said, well, he said, I'll make the time. I'll look at it. And uh, he waited and waited, and finally I called him back. And the phone rings a few times and he picks it up and there's a worm a grunt. And I said, mm -hmm. he said, uh-huh. I said, do we have a comment? He said, my God, do you guys have a comment? <laughs> I said, well, Jim, thank you for doing this for us. And he said, you don't understand. This is by far the strangest comment I've ever seen in my life. And I'm going to spend the rest of the night on it. I'm going to spend the rest of the week on it. Turned out he spent the rest of the year on it. He dropped everything he was doing to concentrate on this comment. In the meantime, I continued to look for comments. In 1994, I was able to find another one, this one in the constellation of Aculeus. And then a long time passed after that, I finally was able to find a comment on uh, October the 2nd, 2006. And except for an electronically discovered comet in 2010, that was the most recent comet that I found. So let's enjoy comets for a little bit. Comets in poetry, comets in art, and a little bit of music as well. The music that I'm choosing is from Mary Chapin Carpenter. And it's, I think, one of her favorite songs. Because I remember listening to a political companion when Jarrison Keeler used to write it. And she was on the show, and uh, they asked her to do one song, and this is the song she did. And so let's enjoy some pictures of comets to Mary Jacob Carpenter and, and Harry James Jackson. Come. I have to tell you that uh, SL9 was certainly not the most famous comet ever. That honor goes to Halley's Comet. And it wasn't a famous comet because of what it was. It was a famous comet for what it did. It was the first time that humanity got a view of what happens when two things collide in the solar system. I know there was at least one person in this audience tonight who told me that he got his start in astronomy because of the collision of SL9. And I tend to hear that from at least one person in every auditorium that I attend, every, every group that I visit. It's a fairly common story, and it's something that I really like to do. But I don't want to talk to you tonight about the story of this online. Instead, I want to show you some pictures. And it's going to be done to a piece of music written by Chris de Berg, a very famous uh, English composer, uh, composer songwriter. <clears throat> the song is in two verses. I'm doing the first verse I'm going to show you, which is of the comet itself, as I'm beginning with the discovery, photographs here. And the second verse I'm going to show you, which is of the collision with Jupiter. The name of the song is Lady in Red. And I'm writing that because I wish to dedicate that song to Wendy. Because when I first met Wendy, after a long, long time, we were the results of a fix-up. My mom and I, my mom was trying to get me together with somebody. And uh, Wendy's mom was trying to get her daughter together with somebody, anybody. And uh, Wendy's mom came to visit my mom and they decided, well, let's get David and Wendy together. And the mother came up with a proposal. And I just jumped, you know me, I just didn't waste a second. I jumped on it, ran over to meet Wendy. Seven years. <laughs> oh, seven long years. It even got to the point that I, Mom said, did you ever get together with Wendy or even write to her or even do anything? And I said, no, not yet. And she said, oh, forget the whole thing. You're not going to do that. That is what set me off. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally got to meet her and we were at all her home. And she opened it up and she was dressed in a red outfit. Nice summer, beautiful day. And she was gorgeous. 
didn't fall in love with her that minute, but I certainly noticed. And uh, eventually I did fall in love with her. And uh, I remember visiting Mom a few years later, talking about Wendy and she looks at me and she smiles. She said, are you telling me that you and Wendy are going to get together? And I said, yep, we are. And we did. I'm sorry Wendy isn't here tonight, but she likes, she kind of likes it when I go off to a conference like this. She wishes there could be more. She wishes there could be more at States Region conferences that I could go to. It gives her kind of a chance to be by herself a little bit, watch the TV shows she likes, and not have to put up with so much of David. But Right. I'll be back home tomorrow, and uh, there'll be more Duffy to put up with. The song that I'm going to play is called The Lady in Red. In that book, which is my memory, this quote is from Dante, La Vita Nuova. On the first page, that is the chapter when I first met you, appear the words, here begins. the whole story, but I've tried to catch the highlights. I've tried to, um, to tell you that the journey, although mostly fun, has not been entirely without unhappiness and incident. I remember one story that happened that I really would like to share with you at the end of my talk. It was when I was 12, and Dad was revealing this one evening at dinner with a book he read when he was a kid about a guy named Joshua Cole, who ends up discovering evidence of life on Mars. And it's a long Dickensian type story in which he's almost <coughs> killed by bullets ricocheting around the observatory dome, just as he's discovering evidence of life on Mars. And at the very end of the book, as he's lying in bed recovering from these grievous wounds, somebody comes in with a whole pile of newspapers. And I said, what's going on? He said, something's broke. This thing you discovered on Mars? I said, yeah. It's confirmed. There is life on Mars. <clears throat> and they're all looking at the newspaper. He brings it to Joshua, the slide in bed. And uh, then Daddy's telling us the story. And he's really waxing so quiet. Just clearly a lot of this story. And he said, <clears throat> At the very end of the book, he quoted the last few words. First to report discovery. Coal of Spyglass Mountain, famous in a night. He loved that line. Famous in a night. <clears throat> said, David, I know you're not going to give up. This is trying to be crazy of yours. You're in it too seriously. But if you ever find a copy of that book, I would love to read it. And boy, I tried to find it. And every now and then, Dad would ask. And as Daddy himself grew older and began to age, and his mind began to get less efficient, started to fade away from school, he had to retire from law. And then, when he was obvious that his memory began to fail. He forgot people, he forgot places, and on one very sad day, he forgot that I was his son. But he never forgot that wonderful childhood story of Joshua Cole on this mountaintop discovering evidence of life on Mars. And tonight, if you go outside, you'll see Mars rising around midnight or so. That's the Mars he was looking at. And it was just an amazing opportunity. And then one day, we were in Florida, I went her home, my parents went her home in Florida, and Dad you know, we were walking and I said, I don't know who this man is. He's not my dad. What's left of him? And I was thinking, how long can it be before this walk is over? And suddenly, you know, the circuits aren't working. But suddenly, something shakes and all the circuits come together for just a moment. Dad grabbed my arm and he said, did you ever find calls like this man told me? And I said, I had to admit I had. And he laughed, he said, well, it doesn't matter, I can't read anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the same day, he said, well, I'm going to die before my time. I said, I sure as hell hope not, Dad. He did. 
who had died in February of 1986. And my mother lived decades longer. And we were, in fact, looking really forward to celebrating her 100th anniversary in June. But instead, we spent her 100th birthday dividing things in her home. Because mom passed away in March. Anyway, I like to think that my father's own interest in astronomy passed off on my mom a little bit. Because she liked to look out at the stars. She was particularly interested in the New Horizons mission to Pluto. She could hardly talk by then, but she wanted me to explain it to her. And if all I did was look at her and say, Pluto, that was enough for her. She liked to hear She liked to hear it, even though she couldn't understand what I was saying. <clears throat> anyway, there was a, uh, I want to play this piece <coughs> It was written by a man named Ken Miedema, who was a blind pianist, who I told this story to him. It really meant something to him. He just wrote a little song about me sending up my telescope, and looking at you with her, and saying, Daddy, come look at you in the sky. <coughs> See what's there. Bring me all the way back to September the 1st. And after I finish <coughs> showing you this little movie with the music, I'm going to end with a quote by Ralph Hodgson. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's a famous English poet. And he wrote a piece called, called The Song of Honor. And if I were to quote the entire poem, it would take me 17 hours and 22 minutes. And I think that the police would come to me if I can take it if I did that. So I'm just going to quote the last few lines of it. I hope you've enjoyed our time together tonight. It wasn't so much a lecture as a, a visit into our living room to tell you a little bit about the life I believe I've led and continue to lead. And to also tell you that it ain't quite done yet. And I'm still uh, looking forward. In fact, as John Denver used to say, it does turn me on in the world. And uh, there are a lot of fun times ahead, I'm sure. I stood and stared. The sky was lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood. I knew not why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars, and still I stared into the sky. Thank you very much. And we've got some more uh, things, but first, Clint, surprise, can you please bring the blue tickets over? Scott. Organizers, the Sugar Creek Group, um, you know, all these people here. Please stand up if you were involved in organizing uh, the United States Regional National Conference. 